But uh, let me first say good morning to everyone uh, and welcome to this digital press conference. It's hosted by the Global Challenges Foundation. Uh, and uh, I don't know if you followed the, the big survey that was carried out by the UN not long ago in the UN 75 reformation agenda. And uh, when they had that survey, survey, it was very clear that the biggest threat uh, to humanity seen from, from all over the world was environment and climate. That was no doubt. So, so many people are worried about that. So many people are engaged in climate and in environment and in other global catastrophic risks. And, and the focus of our foundation, Global uh, Global Challenges Foundation is also on the global catastrophic risks. Uh, we are there because we can see the inter interdependence that is growing among people cross-border, but we don't see the development of institutions at the same time. And we identify that as, as a very big risk gap because that, that doesn't give us the, the tools really to handle these catastrophic risks. Uh, so what can we do about these risks? And when are the upcoming meetings that will deal with these risks in, in 2021? Well, we have asked Mats Engström to guide us a little bit into the coming year when it comes to these meetings and, and also look back in history, what has been successful and what has not. Mats Engström is a former uh, Deputy State Secretary at the Ministry of Environment. He's also an author. He's a journalist and he is a former editor, uh, Chief Editor at the New Te Technology here in Sweden. And uh, Mats is open for questions from you after his presentation. We will also uh, record this event so it can be seen at our homepage, not the least for those who had problem this morning to, to check in on, on Zoom with us. Uh, so, and I know that there is a possibility also after your presentation to, to raise questions either on the chat or by raising your raise but, hand button here on, on Zoom. So with, with uh, further, no further delay, Mats, I would like to hand over to you to present what's coming up here in 2021 when it comes to climate and environment. Happy thank to have you here. That, Jens, and uh, thank you everybody for logging in. Uh, this is of course a huge uh, topic. I will only try to give a short overview. And uh, uh, as uh, uh, Jens said, this will be about uh, the global agenda in 2021 when it comes to climate and the environment. Uh, as Jan said, I have a background in uh, environmental issues and also as a journalist. And I also worked in Asia. I'm now an independent writer and analyst for working for Global Challenge Foundation and also some other institutes and think tanks. Uh, so uh, I will give some examples. There is also this document uh, that I hope you have access to, which uh, discusses uh, and uh, some more events and also has a list of number of major events. Not all events, there are so many. Uh, but uh, what I have done is that I have looked upon this, uh, of course, with different kinds of desktop research. I have also made interviews with a number of negotiators and other people working with this. And, I also have some of my old experience to fall back upon. But of course, one can look upon this in different ways. I'm really looking forward to the discussion and questions and afterwards. So first, of course, there is the meeting of the Climate Convention in November in Glasgow. Uh, there will be a discussion on what is called the Paris leftovers, for example, the rules for trading with emissions, if you like to phrase it like that, the carbon mechanisms rule book, uh, and the big issue about loss and damage for particular developing countries uh, uh, who uh, are subject to climate change. 
I will not dive into this. There are other photos for that, but I would like to note, as others have done as, as well, and for also for other processes, that it's really a huge impact now in the process when you cannot meet. You can try to keep this going with digital negotiations, but you hear from the negotiators, you can see in some what is also public, that there is always these complaints that people cannot meet in public. That doesn't mean it's impossible, but it's a big obstacle also for other processes. Uh, now, of course, the UK is co-hosting this with Italy. One important thing is the revised uh, national determined contributions. The latest I saw, there was about 40 or 45 countries, uh, parties that had uh, put forward their revised NDCs. Some important ones are we were still waiting for if they will come. India, for example, I know the UK is paying a lot of attention to. Of course, the China's five-year plan will also be very important and linked to this. What I would like also to, to highlight is um, what I think the UK is doing very well as a presidency, and that is that aside of the negotiation process itself, which is always complicated, uh, they are pushing for what you could call coalitions of the willing. They have high ambition coalitions for uh, energy, the Energy Transition Council, they have for net zero emission vehicles or zero emission vehicles. And I think this way of bringing together governments and international institutions to create the, the possibilities for different actors will also be very important on the road to Glasgow. Uh, there is the issue about climate financing. I will come back to that. Uh, there has been progress towards this $100 billion a year target for climate financing, but for a number of reasons, this might be more complicated now. Um, aside of the negotiation process, there is also, of course, what is happening in different major economies. I mentioned uh, important steps there, and we know about the net zero target set in Asia, for example. We are waiting for the US administration, the Biden administration. There's the big issue about the recovery from the pandemic crisis. According to number of analysis, much of this recovery is not so green, it's rather brown. How will this um, affect climate uh, uh, policies and the development there? The European Union is kind of an exception here with a more green recovery than some other parts of the world. Two important processes are the G7 and the G20. G7 chaired by the UK with the summit in Cornwall in June and G20 with the summit in Rome in October. But these are of course taking place also in other uh, forests than the summit. So this will be important during the whole year. And just to point to that, there are also other uh, important processes. A lot of things happening with the relations between China and Africa, both on depth on the continuation of the Belt and Road Initiative and other things, and the EU trying to develop its relations with Africa, especially this year. Uh, so this is a complicated and big picture on climate, but of course much attention focused to Glasgow. On biodiversity, we don't know yet the latest I saw, the official documents were all, all, all still saying that the COP15 would take place in Kunming, China in May, but it might of course be later. Uh, there have been a lot of difficulties during the preparations, both because of countries pointing to difficulties with uh, the digital meetings, but also because uh, Brazil in particular is seen as uh, obstructing this uh, process with the Bolsonaro government there. Uh, China will be crucial as host. Uh, it will be important to see, for example, what they do on trying to mobilize financing for new commitments. And it will be important what the Biden administration kind of signal it gives on biodiversity. There is also here a kind of coalition of the willing, the leaders pledge for nature with more than 90 countries uh, giving a message uh, towards coming what could be uh, in the agreement. And what was uh, seen, uh, what has been seen as lacking from the earlier IG targets on biodiversity is more concrete steps when it comes both to financing and to implementation mechanisms in the convention. 
Something that is perhaps not discussed as much as climate and biodiversity is what I have called here non-toxic material cycles. This is chemicals where there is the meeting this summer in Bonn to see how this process called SciChem can continue about the safe management of chemicals. And there is a co-meeting of three conventions on waste and chemicals in July. And this is important also because issues around global value chains are becoming uh, more and more coming to the center of global environmental policy as well as uh, uh, linked to economy and trade. And the plastic waste is one such example, for example, where there is uh, a lot of also economic uh, discussions around what is happening with the global, if you say, markets for plastic waste. Then, um, finally, in this part, uh, there are the discussions broader about re reinforcing environmental governments and what Jens was touching upon at the beginning, how do you handle these kind of risks more general. The idea was to have the United Nations Environmental Assembly now in February for almost one week. It has been uh, divided now, so there will be a virtual meeting two days now in February. Uh, it will be difficult then to agree on that much concrete steps uh, on this virtual meeting, but what will happen is that it will be a launch of the UNEP at 50 process. The United Nations Environmental Program was started as a consequence of the Stockholm Conference in 1972. So this will go on for one year with a number of events and what they hope for to have a declaration in 2022, in February 2022, about global environmental government governance and the gaps there. In parallel, there are preparations for a conference in Stockholm in 2022, probably in June, as far as I understand, which will deal, I will come back to this, but will also deal with global environmental challenges. So this was a very broad, uh, quick overview of some elements on the agenda. Uh, of course, one can talk about oceans, for example, and a lot of other issues, but I, I would like to not make this too uh, long to go to some observations more in general. And one of them, of course, a day like this is uh, the new momentum in Washington with the Biden administration quickly rejoining the Paris Agreement. And this, of course, is a very important step. It is a window of opportunity to have a new administration in the US. One should note that the team Biden has chosen is, I would say, very strong when it comes to climate. I interviewed, uh, for example, Gina McCarthy for the book uh, Jens mentioned. And one thing, uh, she who now will be the national climate czar in the White House. And one, one thing she emphasized, which you, I think you can see in this team is also the link between the national action in the US and the international engagement uh, with the clean power uh, act, for example, uh, being linked to, to when the Obama administration wanted to, to also gain international confidence for the international negotiations. One should say, though, that uh, Joe Biden has, has caused national crisis, multiple national crises to, to handle. And whereas there's a very concrete plan on climate, as I see it, and a very strong team, it is more um, unclear how the Biden administration will act on other very important uh, uh, environmental issues. And I mentioned oceans where the Obama administration had a strong global engagement to their calls in the US. Now I see also for new initiatives on oceans. And if the Biden administration would do this quickly, it could also provide uh, uh, momentum for this uh, Kunming conference in the biodiversity uh, convention. There is the issue about chemicals and waste, uh, where the US is not part of the Basel Convention, the Stockholm Convention, but has joined the Minamata Convention on Mercury. Maybe there could be some movement here. That would be very interesting to, to watch. And of course, also relations, transatlantic relations, the new role of the UK and what is happening in the US-China relations. The other observation I would like to do is that uh, one cannot see, I think, this global environmental agenda separate from very big uh, developments in other issues. 
Uh, on debt, the IMF has warned about the rising debt in developing countries. And this is really a big, big difficult issue also combined with the humanitarian crisis. Uh, I have seen um, calls also as recent as today in The Guardian by Gordon Brown, the former UK prime minister, for a number of measures here on uh, the debt situation for developing countries. And this, I think, is also linked to the climate financing issue up to Glasgow, because uh, the needs are bigger in developing countries. And there is also a risk, I would say, that after these recovery measures, the stimulus will come a time of austerity in the richer countries. And that will also uh, then be very important in Glasgow to have very clear targets for financing to 2025 and later. And the other issue is the health crisis. I mean, this is very evident when it comes to vaccines with Dr. Tedris of the WHO talking about the risk for a catastrophic moral, moral failure when it comes to this big division on the access to vaccines. But it's also much broader than that uh, when it comes both to medicines and the infrastructure for health. And there are calls from South Africa and India, for example, in WTO to waive intellectual property rights for vaccines. But there is also a number of events this year the World Health Assembly, for example, uh, where health will be in the forefront. Another uh, uh, observation, I will soon finish, but um, this might seem perhaps a little more technical than what I talked about before, but the discussion about carbon border adjustments, a kind of fee at the border on steel and cement and other products with large carbon footprints, uh, there, the European Union, the Commission has promised to make a proposal in June. Uh, this has been discussed a lot in relation to, to China, and there has been already strong reactions from China and Russia, which are critical to this kind of measure. Um, but it's also a sign of the broader geoeconomics and geopolitics of this um, movement towards net zero in Europe, for example, that this creates also new and tensions. And there are interesting analyses uh, about how such a carbon border adjustment mechanism would affect countries in the neighborhood of Europe, like Algeria and uh, Ukraine exporting steel and, uh, and uh, cement, for example. So these are uh, issues that need to be dealt with not to uh, cause uh, problems up to Glasgow, there is a lot of talk about EU-US coalitions on this topic, but there is also voices uh, saying that there is a risk for uh, ganging up feeling among other parts of the world and people, which I think is wise, advocating a more multilateral approach uh, to this issue about carbon border adjustments. And finally, uh, looking towards a little bit longer time perspective, as Jens mentioned, there are these big issues about uh, global governance and catastrophic risks with the Stockholm Plus 50 meeting and the United Nations uh, Environmental Assembly. And uh, uh, this was not quite the idea from the beginning to have these two big events in 2022. As I mentioned, the United Nations Environmental Assembly has been partly postponed. I know people are working very hard on how to make the best of making synergies of these two events. And Sweden will also hold the presidency of the European Union in 2023. And I'm sure these events can be uh, mutually reinforcing. For example, the United Nations Environmental Assembly is a very formal process. Stockholm Post 50 process still has to negotiate a declaration, but there's a lot of possibilities to do as the UK has done and to bring in different kinds of coalition and the willing, take up perhaps broader issues about green recovery, green jobs and other issues that might be on the agenda. But I think I will stop here on this very uh, quick overview and just to, to repeat one point is that this has to be seen in the context also of these other big issues and to some extent catastrophic risk like pandemics that the Global Challenge Foundation is also doing a lot of other uh, important work on. So thank you. And I'll open then for uh, questions uh, if I just uh, stop sharing this uh, presentation first, if you would like to 
ask or perhaps comment something. Thank you very much, uh, Mats. And I'm, I take the privilege to, to ask your first question, and that is, who do you see is actually pushing the agenda? Is it a certain country? Is it a, a movement among the civil society? Or with your long experience here, who, 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 is, uh, who is the one pushing for, and who is the one stopping us from having less CO2 in, in the air? Yes, uh, that is that uh, people used to often say a good question. Of course, it's easy that you look upon the governments here and you can see some governments uh, uh, acting forcefully. As I said, I think it's impressive how the United Kingdom is working on the path to Glasgow and there are different coalitions of the willing. Uh, uh, I mean, you have uh, now the Green Deal in the European uh, Union, but you have also uh, other parts of the world, I mean, Costa Rica, the country is pushing very, very hard uh, on these issues. But one effect I would say about the pandemic is that uh, there is a risk that this reduces the important role of the civil society. And uh, there's both research and if you talk to negotiators, uh, strong evidence that a vibrant civil society with good uh, knowledge of issues is important. And, and this is, uh, perhaps something that one has to think about in this process to Glasgow in this current situation. How can you do even more to encourage uh, the participation of civil society? Then there, I mean, there's a lot of the answers to your question. Uh, I mean, if you talk about the financial sector, I think that's very, very important what has happened with the financial sector's uh, uh, engagement for climate issues the last five or 10 years. We can talk more about that if you like. See, you can see, Mats, uh, by yourself that there are questions in, in the chat, and, and so, so I hand it over to you. Yes, and I think Elsa was first there. Elsa, would you like to raise a question live? Yes, can, can I put... Yes. Okay, <laughs> sorry, I did uh, understand. So, yes, um, I have two or three questions. Um, first, I wanted to know if you can um, uh, tell a bit more about what you said about recovery not uh, being so green um, so far as we can see. Um, I also wonder about this e China-Africa relations and what effect that will have. Um, okay, I can stop there. I can... Uh, Ask another question later if I have enough time. Mm. Uh, yes, you're welcome to ask uh, more questions. Uh, yes, on on this character of the uh, recovery, and I, if you like, I can email you some of these uh, studies. There is studies, from example, from the Vid Economics that has looked upon this, and there are studies uh, which the Stockholm Environmental Institute uh, is involved in, and there is also something called the carbon. Uh, I, I don't remember the name, the carbon transition watch or something. And I think what is common in these studies is that they look upon um, both the specific green stimulus measures, but also the, um, uh, the general measures like uh, uh, the kind of uh, uh, packages that has been made to save enterprises, to put it uh, simply. And then they link that to whether these companies are doing business in, in um, uh, that is dependent on fossil fuels. So it's not specifically that much money, perhaps. Well, some parts of it is going to direct fossil fuel extraction and things like that. But it's more that it is, if you look at the, I mean, uh, air transport, for example, it would go into the brown uh, category. And some of these studies are also looking to do the support, for example, for air transport, uh, have environmental conditions or not, and many of them don't. So, so when I say the general picture is based on at least three of these broader overviews, but there are also uh, exceptions. And one must say that the European Union is, uh, is, uh, 
it's doing a kind of green recovery, not the perfect green recovery, but in comparison to other parts of the world so far. Then it is also dependent on the ground, what happens on the ground. If you look at Europe, will it really result in these measures being taken to the same extent as they are saying? That's the next step, so to speak. Uh, and your second question was about China and Africa. Yes, um, and I, I should say I'm, I'm not uh, an expert on this, but I think it's really uh, important to look at this uh, relationship. And of course, China has also relations to Latin America and other parts of the world. One issue is uh, the debt issue, uh, where uh, China has been part, the G20 agreed on some debt suspension now in November, and China has been part of these kind of initiatives, but there is really a large debt uh, burden, if you would say, for many countries in Africa. And China is uh, lending a, a lot of money and the kind of, so, so um, uh, this would be interesting to watch also because in China, there are some concerns about the exposure of the banking sector to bad loans. So, so there might be a tendency that China is not so, so fond of debt relief or giving new uh, loans. Of course, there was also be relations to political pressure uh, here. So debt is one such issue. Another issue is then the uh, how much of Chinese lending and development aid that will go to uh, coal in the future, fossil fuel. There are a number of studies showing that Chinese uh, development aid and lending has gone to quite a lot of fossil fuel extraction, extraction and coal power. And there are interesting studies and work going on in Beijing on the China Council, for example, on how they can reduce both their uh, brown footprint from this kind of loans and investments, but also the environmental footprint on their own production. So that is also very important, I think. But you're welcome to come back with, with more issues and I can send you links to some of these uh, studies. Uh, then I think... Then I think uh, Laurie has got also, or you wanted a follow up question as one at once there, Elsa? Uh, then uh, Laurie asked uh, important questions in the web here. Uh, how do we speed up action on climate change sufficiently in an era of growing political polarization? And also, how do you have a vibrant civil society that agrees on facts in an era of widespread? I, I can't read the rest there, but I guess it's linked to the first one of the political polarization and the kind of fake news uh, topic, I guess. Yeah, I can. Uh, I yeah, mean, please, please. what I'm asking basically is that do, do we, you know, you mentioned that civil society is so important <clears throat> in, in holding government to account and, and driving forward these things. You know, we've seen this with some of the youth protest movements around climate change and and other things, but I'm, a, I'm an American and I look at my own country and think, how do you have a, a civil society that drives forward the right kind of action when people don't, do, dis, don't agree on the basic facts because of misinformation, which is a problem in many places. And then given those issues and the polarization, how do you actually speed up climate action to the level needed? You know, we are making these these bits of progress that are that are impressive, but they're still not emissions are still rising, <clears throat> and we're you know we're not seeing that peak coming very soon. How do we change that? Uh, that's a, a broad and important question. I think maybe Jens would also like to to comment on this because I know he has been thinking and the foundation has been thinking around these kind of issues as well. Uh, I think you just to give a few uh, inputs to that. Uh, um, from, if you look at environmental negotiations historically, it has been very important to have a knowledgeable civil society. Uh, and uh, that ranges from broad mobilization, but not the least uh, these um, uh, knowledgeable uh, environmental organizations that know sometimes more than the negotiators, I could say from my own experience uh, once upon a time. And they are still there, they are providing very good and relevant uh, uh, input. Um, uh, and I think that even if you're absolutely right about the polarization and this question about uh, 
uh, well, uh, that is more divisive than before. Uh, I, I think that's still important. The other thing which I'm still uh, uh, believing in is that when you have organizations that have a strong uh, membership, uh, and uh, I'm thinking, for example, about the trade unions, if you look at our country, Sweden, the Northern Europe, if you look at uh, what uh, has partly, I guess, uh, now you're the expert on that, but uh, if you look at what Joe Biden is saying and what has carried him to the presidency, the trade unions are still important, although perhaps they are weaker than before. And this is on climate change, very, very important what the trade unions will do and what they convey to their members. They still have their channels that people still meet when they take a break at work and talk. So, so even if you have all these social media issues, you have this divisive uh, trends, you have these uh, bubbles uh, of, of views, one has to also believe in that you still can have this kind of contact through organizations, I think. And then lastly, uh, on the media, having worked as a journalist myself, um, this is different to different parts of the world, but high quality journalism is very important. I believe just as an outsider, this has been absolutely very, very important in the, in the US, looking at the high quality journalism that has been done there. Uh, we have a discussion uh, here uh, where public service is stronger about the role of public service. I personally believe that one asked your question here is, is a strong public service uh, uh, media uh, that, that can also go into this kind of issues like uh, being a counterweight to, to Facebook. Uh, that is a big discussion, but maybe Jens would like to ask, add something to this uh, important topic as well. Yes, thank you. I, I'll try. I'll try as a former politician or former minister in the Swedish government. I mean, if you are a politician, you are you are you are driven by your values. But when it comes to action, there is very much the opinion and the facts, the statistics that are there and and guiding you in your decision. And if there is a di dispute among how you should look into these facts and the statistics, of course, that that avoids you from, from taking the right decision. So, so that is a, is a very important question. And, and, and I can't answer them more than that we try to also emphasize and to, to build up the reputation when, when there are research, when there are surveys, I still think that the IPCC, the, the climate panel in, in, in the UN, have some good reputation. But then I'm speaking for, for myself, from Sweden, from Europe, and, 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 but I know there are other contexts in, in other parts of the world. So, and, and how to handle this, I think, is, is actually that we need a new generation that, that is more open for media literacy, to not always trust in what you read and to, to, to search themselves for statistics. But that is, yeah, it's, it's a long and difficult road, but very, very important one. Uh, may, I, may I come back to, to one question? When, when the, the Global Challenges Foundation are looking for a better architecture for decision making, we are we are also sometimes talking about global laws, the strengthening and also the executive uh, power in, in, on the global level. And we are looking into the Security Council and we would like them also to, to perhaps lift up the issues of environment and climate because that is today security risks. But another, another uh, thing in, in, in um, in rule of law is is courts, and I don't know much if you had thought or reflected a little bit on on the movement, not the least among young people who want to give the the courts a stronger role. That could be talking about ecocide in ICC, but I, I I'm also uh, the chair of Save the Children here in Sweden, and there also young people are are saying that we are not living up to the child convention. The child convention is there to protect life. 
and, and here the life is in danger. And, and have you thought a little bit on, on that track, the track of, of, of binding laws? Yes, uh, that's uh, also an important issue. And there is also these uh, cases where people are bringing governments to court because of lack of measures to combat uh, climate change. Um, yes, I think this is important. It's still the action. There has to be political decisions about the actions, I think. There has to be a political support, uh, but it can be a path to to progress. And uh, I think that has been one of the success stories uh, about the European Union's environmental policy, that it is legally binding, that there is a European court, that governments can be, uh, they have to pay big uh, bills if they don't follow the laws. Uh, and this kind of issue uh, could be broadened uh, Absolutely, but that's something that you have to build step by step. And, and the problem, I think, if you don't have the political support for it is that you can win some cases, but then there will be a political perhaps movement to, to change these laws and make them less strict. So if you don't also combine it with this uh, building that support, it's not uh, an efficient enough way, I think. I would just like to add also finally on this question that in the Stockholm Plus 50 context, I understand that the role of youth is very important for the government For when I talk to people there for the Stockholm meeting. And of course, this youth engagement and how that can be channeled and also a result in more long-term, uh, uh, I wouldn't say institutions perhaps, but ways of working, that, that's also important. Elsa, would you like to ask something more? Or? Uh, yes, I can ask you, uh, when it comes to the EU, uh, you have mentioned some good things now recently. Uh, I wanted to, what do you think is the most important things that the EU has uh, achieved or are about to achieve uh, when it comes to climate work? Uh, and also, what do you think the EU could do better on? I'm thinking, for example, on this issue of uh, debt that you mentioned with the African countries, for example, and also uh, the relation to other countries so when it comes to, for example, trade agreements, where you mentioned Brazil and there have been recently a trade agreement, and I don't really know how powerful that is uh, on pushing, <laughs> pushing uh, Bolsonaro government, for example, on the, uh, the rainforest issue, or is it working in an opposite direction? So, yeah. Yes, uh, um, first maybe I should say that uh, of course climate action is not enough. We are far from the climate action needed and there is uh, no country or region that is doing enough compared to the challenge. But I do think, uh, especially now with Ursula von der Leyen and, and Franz Timmermans, that the European Union is a positive uh, force. And uh, uh, if you look at uh, the success cases now, the speed that the energy transformation is going on renewables and electricity, for example, is, is something uh, new and partly because of political measures, both in countries like Germany, but also by the European Union. You have record high prices now in the emission trading system that was seen for a number of years ago as almost a failure because prices were so low. Now you have very high prices forcing coal power plants to close. And the commission will propose now the second quarter of 2021, a number of uh, new or reinforced measures. So certainly there is a lot of good things happening now that need to be agreed among all member states. That's not so easy, but you also have Germany and France and others pushing hard for, for this. Uh, but then, uh, and, and once again, I think I, I, I would ask if he else wants to say something about this, as he has been also responsible in government for some of these issues, I believe. But, but in my personal view, I think the European Union, the coherence is still not enough when it comes to different policy areas. And uh, 
if you look at parts of trade policy or if you look at uh, just to take an example now the re recent uh, strategy on uh, on pharmaceuticals uh, which is linked to vaccines and medicines i don't think the eu is uh, doing enough for this kind of global public goods uh, uh, and to make them uh, 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 something that uh, is uh, accessible enough for poor developing countries. There is a lot of scope for, for improvement there, I, I think. And that, I think that is very important now in this current situation for the climate negotiations that the EU shows, for example, on health, a progressive agenda that kind of give, builds also trust, both on that and on debt uh, relief. But uh, I'm sure Jens has mm. things to say about this. Yeah, I don't know. I, I don't think I have so much interesting to say about this, but but the reflection from doing things in Europe and in, in the rest of the world when it comes to COVID-19 is I've often said that when, when you should change the, the official use of uh, measures or when you should change the government, it's, it's like a, a big ship. It takes time. But here you can see the opposite. You can take a a decision from one day to another, as long as you have the support among the people, as long as people see this, that this is so dangerous, so we are in favor of these decisions. And then I think Angela Merkel, for instance, her popularity is still growing because they have a feeling she has taken the right decisions, although they have been very hard. So I think the, the challenge is for us who believe that the the climate crisis is a very, 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 very big risk. We have to spread the news. We, we have to have an opinion that is giving these uh, possibilities also to the governments, because I think the governments, they are there to, to carry out the decisions, the will of the people. But if they don't have that support, it is very tricky. And we could see when, when Macron, for instance, tried to increase the taxes of gas and, and the resistance that he got, because it has to go hand in hand with the opinion of the people. And that is, I think that is the big challenge for, for political change, whatever subject we should dis we discuss. But with, with saying this word, I would like to thank you very much, Mats. And it's also a possibility to, to reach out to us. And, and we will also give the, the the questions back to you because I think we will come back in this format and you're also writing a, a larger report perhaps much you should you could end by by telling a little bit of what's what's ahead of you for you yes and, and thank you uh, everybody for this uh, occasion uh, I'm also doing a lot of report that is deals with uh, success factors in earlier international negotiations and how this can also give lessons for current reforms of uh, global environmental governments governance but we will be back with more about information about that and uh, invite you to the presentation once it's ready thank you thank you very much thank you.